My song list is in the Bible. Today's been one of those days where it's like, where's my head? Oh, it's still there. It's still there. Let's stand with uh, the Blue Hymn Book, turn to number 261. Number 261, Trust and Obey. And to get the announcements out of the way as well, December 7th, the uh, teen event on Wednesday says that they'll be done. You guys will be done an hour after service, so just plan on being about an hour after service is over. Wrapping up then, December 9th is the Secret Sisters party. That's at 6 p.m., um, so bring an appetizer, 6 p.m., bring an appetizer. That's December 9th. December 10th, which is the very next day, Saturday is the Hayride. Meet at church, and Brother Kurt has flyers, I believe. He has them. He doesn't have extras up there. Are they on the table? Sound table. Okay, so flyers for the caroling. Um, all the info is on those. It's on the sound table by Sawyer back there. Um, December 25th, uh, Christmas Day itself, there's no afternoon service, so if you show up, you'll be having church by yourself. <laughs> the rest of us won't be here, so no no services on the 25th. And then, guys, uh, New Year's Eve, plan on having just a short, what is it, 15 minutes? No longer? Yes. Something around that? Okay. Have a short message prepared, um, a testimony, if anything, um, but come prepared for that. And we'll go with 261. to try. 
401. 401. Kids are dismissed. And if you want to get Mark chapter 16 or Matthew, go to both. Go to Matthew 28, end of Matthew. Let's read that one first. And Mark 16. Pretty much wrapping up the questions here with this one tonight. I have one more um, next week that I'll answer um, on Bible um, reading schedules and, and study materials, so we'll cover that next time. But tonight we're going to look at this question here. Um, in Mark, it says... Uh, there's a verse that talks about those who believe in Jesus and are baptized can cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up serpents. Some religious, religions and churches do this. And I was just wondering, is this an actual, literal verse that should be done? Did anybody bring any snakes tonight? No? Okay. Anybody bring any deadly things to drink tonight? No? Okay. Well, you're not taking the Bible literally then. But let's look at the verses, start in Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verse 19, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Go to Mark 16. Mark 16. This is the same um, conversation. Verse 14, afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. So Matthew didn't tell you this happened here. Unbelief, hardness of heart. Why did Jesus get onto their case about this? Because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. You better watch out for somebody who rejects a testimony of a spoken witness. 
You have spoken witnesses in recorded history, and when people question recorded history in favor of other evidences, sometimes there's a problem with their heart. Um, the pattern in scientific studies is that you take the archaeological evidence as the most weight, and then you take any literary weight besides the Bible, any literary written thing as the next most important thing, and then you take the Bible last. And if the Bible says anything opposite, then the Bible is sure to be wrong. That's the standard uh, way of approaching your studies in a secular university and many Christian universities. And Jesus Christ is completely against that approach. He says, you guys are uh, getting upbraided. That's a reprove or a reproach or to find fault with somebody. They are accused of unbelief and having a hard heart because they didn't believe the people that said they saw Jesus. Now, you have a testimony in this book of people who said they saw Jesus after his resurrection. And you need to take that evidence with a right heart on what the Lord uh, gives to you today. Look, at, look up a couple verses before we get to this question here. It says in verse um, 6, look at verse 6, He said unto them, Be not affrightened. This is the angel that appeared after the resurrection. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee, and there shall you see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. And then look at this. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. So what does unbelief lead to? You say, how do you know they didn't believe what the angel said? Because Jesus told you they didn't believe. <laughs> That's why they got rebuked. What does unbelief lead to their response here? It leads to them being afraid when they shouldn't have been afraid, and it leads them to not speaking up when they should have spoken up. Neither spake they these words. See that? So what happens when you uh, have something that the Lord does in your life, and then you question it, and then you have doubts, and then you don't um, believe the things that the Lord has shown you? It causes you to have a fear of man that bringeth a snare, and it causes you to not speak up for the Lord. So, look at verse 15. After he rebukes them for not speaking up, he says, I want you to start speaking up. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be what? Shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be what? shall be damned all right so that is damnation in hell sometimes damned in the bible doesn't mean that here it certainly does verse 17 and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name uh, that believe in my name shall they cast out devils they shall speak with new tongues they shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover so then after the lord had spoken unto them he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Now, I take the Bible literally as long as I can take it literally, and I try to make everything literal. Um, I've never been bitten by a snake. Anybody here been bitten by a poisonous snake? Nope, because if they're poisonous, they usually kill you, don't they? Okay. Uh, sometimes they strike at your boots when you're out there moving stuff around in the field and the... Um, closest I've been to a snake in Montana is we were working on a survey crew and we had a stick that had a little UFO thing on the top. Have you ever seen those on the side of the road? It's a satellite receiver for a Trimble setup. Anyways, we were walking through the, um, it was near a river. Uh, that was the reason we were there is this river needed a new bridge. So we were surveying for weeks and weeks and weeks, taking a, a shot of the elevation every 25 feet in any direction. So that took weeks for a crew of four people. And uh, I was with this big Mexican guy, he's about twice as big as me, and he was holding the, the post and I was holding the clipboard I think that day. And he saw a big old green bull snake rear its head, <laughs> it was like two feet off the ground, it was like two or three inches around. And uh, I had never seen that guy move so fast. I didn't know big people could move that fast, but they'll surprise you sometimes. <laughs> they'll, they can get up and they got a low gear that they don't often reveal. And he, he jumped about 10 feet back and t kept running. And uh, then the thing just disappeared. It was green, so we couldn't find it anymore. That was, that's the closest I've come to a snake in Montana. I'm certainly not going to go collect them from the, um, what's that store up on Grand, the, the little pet store? 
I'm not going to go bring any in here and handle them in here this morning. And there's a reason I'm not going to do that, and it's because I choose to take the Bible literally, and I don't just take one verse out of context and then try to make that my proof text for everything. Um, if you want to make the Bible say anything you want to make it say, you can just pick a random verse and you can just go to town with it. Over there, let me see if I can find my notes. I skipped a bunch of stuff this morning. But uh, did you know that you can justify... Um, hmm, where's my list? I just have a mess here. Hmm, this is part of it. I'll save the rest for next week if I can't find the rest of it. Do you know you can justify um, going to church to sin? Over there in Amos 4, it says, Come to Bethel and transgress. Well, Bethel is the house of God. If you want a verse for just going to church and sinning, you can go to Amos 4.4 4 and say, Go to Bethel and transgress, and at Gilgal, and multiply transgressions. That's where the tabernacle was set up. Bethel means the house of God. <laughs> so go to the house of God and transgress. Uh, did you know I can prove from the Bible that you only need to go to church once every three years? Forget this Baptist stuff, three to thrive. Nope, one, to, one every three. To, and uh, the Lord says in the same verse, Amos 4, and bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years. You just save up your tithes. Now, you've got to pay the full tithes. But you, gotta, you can say, save it up for three years and bring it all in one lump sum. I hope somebody's waiting on doing that. I've been waiting for that for a couple years now. You... You can get ahead in life. Uh, according to the Bible, you can justify getting ahead of, in life by being a criminal. Uh, in Job 12, 6, Job said, The tabernacle of robbers prosper. Who does God prosper? He prospers robbers. And they that provoke God are secure, into whose hand God bringeth abundantly. You want to get abundance? Just go rob some banks, and God will bless you abundantly. According to Job 12, 6. Uh, did you know that Jesus never lived on this earth? According to John 3.17, for God hath not sent his son into the world. <laughs> Every one of these, absolutely. Yeah. You know, the Bible says uh, God doesn't exist. In Psalm 14.1, there is no God. You ever run into people that quote the Bible and they quote part of it and misapply part of it and don't even know the context of the passage that they're talking about? Uh, I think this is one of my favorite ones is it's okay to make moonshine let me know this one it's okay to make moonshine in the bible psalm 23 you all have it memorized psalm 23 he leadeth me beside the still right <laughs> see all right all right um, do you know it's a sin to um to eat bread or to drink water According to the Bible, for it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water. You can prove anything you want to prove from this book. Just take it out of context and misapply it. Uh, it's okay to marry a prostitute, Hosea 1-2. Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms. Romans 14-2. Everybody knows this already, but did you know the Bible teaches vegetarians are weak? Another who eateth herbs is weak. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Uh, did you know that all men are emotional? According to the Bible. In Jonah 1.5, it says they cried, every man. <laughs> now, we're going to get back to this thing in Mark 16 in just a minute. But we just read, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And, and we're going to cover that. And then he said... Uh, these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall cast out devils, shall speak with new tongues. Now, anybody here cast out any devils this week or speak in a foreign language that you don't even know what you're saying? All right, we better find an explanation for this verse, and you're not going to find it in these verses in Mark. Um, did you know that God gives bad laws? According to Ezekiel 20, 25, Wherefore I gave them also statutes that were not good. How about uh, this one? Next time you have to be at a church that nominates a new pastor, remember this verse, Micah 2.11. 
make sure you nominate a drunk pastor. If a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, and, and make sure he's a liar and a drunkard, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, even he shall be the prophet of this people. There's a proof text to pick a lying, drunken pastor. And the church people can get drunk too. Uh, Numbers 20, verse 11, and the congregation drank. Now, if you're just going to take little bits and snippets of things here and there and just force them into uh, making it sound like something else, then you're going to have a mess of interpretation of your Bible. But how many people do that? How many churches and how many religions and how many individuals found a verse, they couldn't explain it, or they got somebody to explain it that gave them a false interpretation of the Bible, and then they build the their, their rest of their theology on that? Um, where is the first mention of medicine in the Bible? Anybody know? It's in Exodus. God told Moses to take two tablets. Right. Where is baseball in the Bible? We switched gears here. Where is baseball in the Bible? John didn't sing an extra four songs, so here we are. This, we got time for this now. Where is baseball in the Bible? Come on, you guys know this one. Genesis, in the beginning. But did you know that Eve stole first and Adam stole second? Did you know that? And Cain struck out Abel. And then the angels and the giants got rained out. All right. Yes. Do you know? <laughs> Do you know why Noah never went fishing? If Jenny Peterson was here tonight, I think she would get this one. Because he only had two worms. <laughs> Who was the first surfer in the Bible? This is pretty late. Apostle Paul in Acts 27, because he came ashore on a board. And then I found pickleball in the Bible the other day. Yes. Yeah, it was Joseph. He's the first guy to play pickleball in the Bible down in Egypt. He said he served in Pharaoh's court. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, turn to 1 Corinthians. 12. Uh, make it uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 12. Let's figure out something about these signs. The older I get... Um, and maybe more experienced or more <coughs> associated with other people and other people's beliefs, the more grace I try to have with people because I do understand why so many people are so confused. And like I said this morning, if you missed it this morning, you need this one thing in your Christian life above everything else. I'm assuming that you're saved, and here's the one thing you need. You need to keep your heart right. If your heart is not right, nothing else can be right. My preacher said it a different way. He said the most important thing in this Christian life is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's not right, nothing else will be right. Now, those are similar and overlapping things. Seeking righteousness, loving the truth. Those are all paramount things in your Christian life. And if your heart's right and your doctrine's wrong, you'll turn out okay. You'll do okay. Now, if your heart is right, what will happen to your doctrine? you'll come to the truth. The Lord will bring you and lead you to the truth. All right, look at 2 Corinthians 12 on these signs. 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. Is were present tense, past tense, or future tense? Past. Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience. In signs, there's what we're talking about tonight, and wonders, and mighty deeds. Turn back to Acts chapter 1. Paul tells the Corinthian church in his second letter, he says those signs were in the past, and you saw them yourselves, and they had a purpose. And those signs were for the apostles. Now, maybe you didn't pick that up in Mark, but who was Jesus talking to there in Mark 16? just told you it was the disciples that didn't believe him the report that came from the resurrection but it also said that those disciples would see other people 
believe and be baptized and signs would follow them. Remember that? So it's not only for those 12 disciples. Um, or let's say, let's use the word apostles. Look at Acts 1. Acts 1 and verse 21. It says, Wherefore of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. The requirements for an apostle is that they saw Jesus' beginning of his ministry all the way through to the end of his resurrection. Verse 23, and they appointed two. So this is a nominating committee here. They picked out two men. Joseph called Barsabbas, also surnamed Justice. That's all one guy. And then the second guy is Matthias. Verse 24. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, choose whither of these two thou hast chosen. Don't think that you got a resume from somebody and you know everything about them. I know a a case where two people applied for the same job. One of them was my friend. The other guy I didn't know. He applied for a job in Billings. And both of them were equally qualified. And the lady ended up choosing the other person that wasn't my friend. I don't know his name. Uh, ended up choosing my friend's competitor, I guess, in this um, interview <coughs> process. So my friend went to the lady and said, said, uh, I understand you didn't choose me, and that's your decision, but would you please tell me why? And she said, you are both so equally qualified, we couldn't decide. We usually decide this before we leave the room. But the final decision was up to me because I was the department manager. So they couldn't decide. They left it up to me between you two. And I took both your resumes home, and I laid them on the table, and I prayed about both of them, and the Lord made it clear to me to pick the other guy. Now, that happened at the DOT in Billings, Montana. Maybe revival is possible in Montana. <laughs> and you know what ended up happening? The guy that didn't get picked ended up having applications out at other places. This is my friend, and I can tell you where he is today. But he ended up moving on from that job and seeking bigger and better things outside of the DOT. Now, who knew his heart at the time? He might not have even known his own heart. But the Lord knows the hearts of all men. And the Lord gave that lady that ran that department the, the um, insight and discernment of who to pick. Okay, so they're asking for prayer between, uh, they're praying and asking the Lord between these two men. And then verse 25, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots and the lot fell upon Matthias and he was numbered with the 11. So now they're keeping those 12 apostles slots filled and the purpose is to replace Judas. So it looks like that thing continues out into possibly the millennium where those positions need to be filled when the, everybody is, has their resurrection. But in scripture, besides these 12 apostles, there are also other apostles listed. So I'll say these slow enough if you want to write them down. Uh, just write the references. You don't have to write all the names here. But Romans 16:7. Romans 16, 7, there's two people listed. One is Adrianicus, not sure how to say his name, and then Junia. That's Romans 16, 7. In 1 Corinthians 4, you have Apollos. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 6 and 9. You have Apollos as an apostle. 1 Corinthians 1, 1, you have Sosthenes listed with Paul as an apostle. 1 Corinthians 1, 1, we should put Paul on the list so we don't forget. Paul is on the list as well. And then 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, you have Silas. 1 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1, and also 2.6, Silas is listed as an apostle. Uh, in one of those references, Timothy is also listed as an apostle. So it's either 1 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1, or 2.6. And then Barnabas is listed as an apostle in Acts 14. So how many is that? If anybody was keeping track. Seven or eight. Barnabas, Timothy, Silas, Sosthenes, Apollos, Junior, Andronicus, Paul. So I got eight. Paul, uh, Adrianicus, Junia, Apollos, Sosthenes, Silas, Timothy, Barnabas. And there may be others. That's the, as many as I could find. And then Matthias gets added here, but I count him with the 12. So there's there are other apostles that are being... 
um, given these gifts and these signs and these wonders and these miracles that are going out over Israel and that are also seeing people get healed and seeing people get saved. So turn to 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. And let's look at what the Lord's doing with these signs, why he gave them, and what their purpose is. Now, I get it. I understand somebody reading the Bible saying, I get the signs to heal people, and nothing poisonous can kill me, and I can live forever. Did it ever occur to you that none of the apostles are alive today? Did that ever occur to you? Like, you can't just be like, okay, I got stage four cancer. Boop, healed. <laughs> and then you're 130 years old, and you're like, I'm dying of old age. Boop, healed. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And these signs for an apostle had limitations. They're not just this, uh, I had a, I knew a guy, I should, he's not really a friend of mine, but I knew a guy that he would go to the nursing home and preach to these old people that they needed to have faith to believe that they could stand up and walk and be healed, and they just, it was a problem of their faith. <laughs> I was like, brother, I love your zeal and appreciate your cheerfulness and charisma, but you're an idiot. <laughs> this is not, that's not the wisest thing to preach in the nursing home. <clears throat> he was serious and he believed it with his whole heart he'd never seen it but he believed it 1 Corinthians 1 22 1 Corinthians 1 22 it says for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom do you know what Americans want to hear in a sermon every week they want to hear some hmm? they want to hear some new thing every week do you know why you watch four to 12 hours of YouTube every week? I mean, do you really need to see a guy make the most impossible bounce shot with a basketball from like a thousand feet away and drop it off a cliff and watch it explode on a trampoline? Like, do you need to see all of those new things every week? Okay, you guys gave yourselves away. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You know what the Greeks seek after? They want to learn something new, see the most new, exciting thing. Um, do you know what the Jews require? This is the way the Lord set up them as a nation, as a people. When he called them, he promised them. The very first time he calls them out as a nation and speaks to them, out, well, when he calls them out of Egypt, and Abraham too, but I'm thinking of Moses, kind of the beginning of the nation there after it comes out of being a family for, from Abraham. He calls them out with a sign. Their sign is the burning bush. That's what the Jewish people would trace their first beginnings of a nation to, obviously to Father Abraham. But the Lord gives them a sign, and the Lord lets them, he tells you that they require a sign. And so who are the signs for? Did you notice that Jesus called 12 apostles, and he didn't call any from Germany? He didn't call any from Italy or from Ethiopia. He, he called them from all of these different tribes and areas and nations in the nation of Israel, and he gave them the apostolic signs. So the Jews require a sign. Turn to 1 Corinthians 14. Here's one thing that signs are used for. 1 Corinthians 14. First Corinthians 14, verse 21. In the law, it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, that context is this people is the nation of Israel. This is Isaiah 28. And yet for all that, they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, since they won't hear me, since they won't listen, verse 22, wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. If you go to a church service and everybody's talking in tongues, trying to convince everybody that believes they got the wrong attitude, they're doing the wrong thing entirely. That's a whole other topic. But they're doing, they have the wrong attitude. The purpose isn't for the people that believe, but it's for people that believe not. Now, do you know what people that believe not see in a charismatic tongue service today? They see a bunch of confusion. Look in verse 23. If the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say, ye are mad? Yes, they will. Yes, they will. Unbelievers would take one glance at that and say, you're crazy, you're foolish. What's the purpose of the tongues, though? Look up at 22 again. The purpose is to them that believe not. 
Now, how come a bunch of people talking in tongues in a modern charismatic church service cause a bunch of confusion and people to say they're crazy, but the purpose of tongues in the Bible is that people that are lost would believe. The tongues are for them that believe not, but prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. You know what the purpose of a church is? The purpose is to preach to people who are saved. That's prophesying. That's preaching. That's giving out the word of God to encourage and edify. Verse 26 all the way through the chapter. What are the signs for? The signs are for people who haven't believed to become believers. And there's a really big hiccup in the book of Acts. Does anybody know what the most difficult thing for a Jewish person to get a hold of would be after Jesus' resurrection? Uh, that he's God, yeah. Some of them accepted that, but they had a bigger problem. Uh, that would be part of it, but not the biggest thing. Is Gentiles getting saved? Now, I know we're all inclusive, equal opportunity Americans, and you don't think like that. But uh, most nations in the whole history of the world think like that. And the Jewish people could not possibly imagine a lost heathen Gentile getting saved without coming to the tabernacle, doing all the rituals, if I could use that word, the cleansing things and the process and the sacrifice and the going outside the camp until he's clean and coming back in. There's, there's procedures for all that for a proselyte. And that was fine. But they couldn't possibly imagine a Jewish person imagine a heathen dog coming in and getting saved and not having to go through the tabernacle, not having to get a sacrifice shed for them, a blood shed for them, and get cleansed up and get sprinkled. All right, sprinkled with the blood and with the water and all that. So what does the Apostle Paul do? Look at Acts 28. Acts 28. Let's stay on these signs because we can go a couple different directions here. But Should we be picking up snakes and drinking Drano? Well, common sense tells you no, but sometimes the Bible leads you to do things that don't make a whole lot of common sense. So let's get the answer from the scriptures on this one. Acts 28, look at verse 3. Paul just got in a shipwreck with a bunch of people. In verse 3, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. Verse 5, And he shook off the beast into the fire. Isn't it strange it calls a viper a beast? And that leaves a mark on his hand. There's like the mark of the beast here, the Apostle Paul after a shipwreck. So you can figure all that out on your own time. Okay, and then verse 6, Albeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. Uh, by the way, what's the church? In, what's the ship in the passage? Isn't the ship kind of a good picture of the church? So are we going to like shipwreck on the shores of heaven at the rapture? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and then the Apostle Paul, the Jewish representation of the remnant, uh, gets smitten with the mark of the beast, but he has the apostolic sign to get it off. So there's some applications in there, but that's a little advanced for our lesson tonight. Verse 6, Howbeit they looked when he should have uh, been swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and so, saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now that just shows you the fickleness of man. They go from saying, These guys, this guy must be a murderer and he's got to be some evil person that the sea somehow he escaped, but he couldn't escape the snake and then he escapes the snake too, so now he must be a god. And I suppose if a tree fell on him, they'd say he was a murderer again and it would just go back and forth forever because men don't have a clue what they're talking about without a final authority. And the Lord gave Paul this apostolic sign that he could heal somebody who was sick, including himself if he get bit by a snake. Verse 7, In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux. That means the blood won't clot. So he's got some kind of wound that won't heal up. To whom Paul entered in and prayed, and laid hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, now notice verse 9, when this was done, also others also which had diseases in the island came and were what? 
That's the last mention of healing in your Bible until you get to Revelation. Now, what happened to these apostolic signs? You get to the end of the book of Acts. Paul heals himself, and he heals somebody else. Turn back to 2 Corinthians 12, where we were a minute ago. Second Corinthians 12 and verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Lots of things revealed to Paul, especially in the beginning of this chapter. There was given unto me a thorn in the what? Sounds like an infirmity. Sounds like a sickness. Sounds like something that needs healed. This thorn in the flesh is the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. Now, when does that ever describe the Apostle Paul before now? Paul is always speaking in boldness. He doesn't care if they arrest him, get thrown in prison, or thrown on a shipwreck, a ship that's going to shipwreck. The Apostle Paul is not known for his weakness. But this thing put him down pretty low. Here we go. B middle of verse 9. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Now here's an apostle that can't heal himself, even though he has the power of Christ resting on him. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities. The Lord just deems this thing necessary for him in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. How many of you have seen the newest Chosen thing? Anybody seen that thing with the one and two episodes, and then he doesn't, well, spoiler alert, plug your ears, then he doesn't uh, heal that one disciple at the end? Which one is that? Thaddeus? Yeah. Is it James? Little James? It's little James. James the less. It's little James in the ESV. So, I, I I sat there while I was watching that, like, is this right? Is this right? Is this right? <laughs> but did the Lord leave Paul some things he couldn't get out of? Didn't Peter and, um, who was it? Peter and in prison, was Paul and Barnabas, and who else? And Peter by himself in prison. <clears throat> didn't Didn't they, like, have an angel show up? and bust all the locks and the doors open, and they just, like, stood up and walked out of there. And then Paul gets to lead somebody to the Lord. Of course, Paul would lead somebody to the Lord, like, in that moment. And then they go on their merry way. And then what happens? Paul says, man, I did it once. I can do it again. And he starts running his mouth. God smite thee, thou whited wall. <laughs> and I knew not that he was the high priest. You didn't, Paul, really? I don't know if I believed you. Uh, you didn't know he was the high priest. You're just talking smack to this guy. And you don't know who he is. You knew who he was. And then he gets thrown in prison and no angel shows up and no gates come swinging open and no bars come up and no shackles come loose. What's going on? The signs of the apostle don't last forever. So Paul gets imprisoned and doesn't get out of prison miraculously. And then he's sick here in 2 Corinthians 12, and he doesn't get healed miraculously. And he says there's a necessity for you that you're going to have to go through these things and be weak so that the Lord can be strong. Look at 1 Timothy 5. 1 Timothy 5. Some of us has kind of a Santa Claus idea about God, that he's just going to, if we just write out our wish list and, Pray it enough times that he's going to bring us all these goodies under the tree. And you're, if you're a parent, you have more sense than to give your child everything they ask for on the list. <laughs> right? They don't need some of those things. Some of those things, they would play with them for two hours, and then they'd get lost or broken or whatever. And we all know that your kids are going to play with the boxes for half of the time. They're going to play with all the toys combined. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Elijah and a Swiss Army knife and a box can just, he could just be gone for days and nobody would even need, I mean, maybe the blank, throw a blanket in the mix, a uh, knife sharpener and weeks. You could just leave him out there eating roots or something. He'd figure out a way if he just had a box and a knife. And, and they don't need every single thing they think they need. And the Lord knows you don't need every single thing you think you need. And you don't get to the, just go to the Lord and say, I want all these things and God give you all these things. Sometimes he gives you what you need, not what you 
think you need. All right, the Apostle Paul didn't need that thorn in the flesh healed, although we all would have healed him if it was our decision. But if we knew what the Lord knew, we, we would agree with the Lord. In 1 Timothy 5, here's a, uh, another situation to somebody who's sick. Timothy's got some, some kind of ailment here, some kind of problem. In verse 22, 1 Timothy 5.22 says, Lay hands suddenly on no man. So that's probably talking about ordaining. If you want the cross reference, that's 2 Timothy 1.6. 2 Timothy 1.6, I don't think that's or laying hands for healing. I think it's for ordaining. Unless it means um, lay hands suddenly on no man. If you're going to hit somebody, make sure you hit them slowly. could mean that because the preacher's not supposed to be a brawler. That might be out of context too. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. So when you ordain somebody, you're, you're saying, I'm in agreement with who you are and what you represent. Now, obviously, all men are sinners, but you don't want to ordain somebody who's in sin and who's not, uh, it wouldn't be uh, appropriate to ordain them. So don't make a rash decision there, and then keep thyself pure. That's in that context of ordaining another. Verse 23, drink no longer water. <coughs> So water as a cure, I believe, not like stop drinking water at all, but drinking water for this specific thing. Timothy knows what he's talking about already. But use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and then often what? Now, why didn't Paul just pull his handkerchief out of his pocket, fold it up, roll it up, stuff it in the envelope, seal it up and send it to him, and heal him like they did back in the book of Acts? Why is he giving... Why is a preacher giving medical advice? Nobody ever appreciates that. But use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. There's something in that, probably alcoholic wine, there's something in that alcohol content that will help whatever bug is going on in his stomach, but it's an often infirmity. So maybe Timothy's stressed out or who knows what, maybe he's got ulcers or something, who knows. Verse 24, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. I don't know what that means in the context of those three verses there, but um, he says, for your sickness, I'm going to give you a medical recommendation. Look at 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4. Second Timothy 4 and verse, um, you should probably note verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Uh, what's the cross reference for Luke being a, a physician? Does anybody have that reference? Paul's traveling with Luke, who's a physician. I don't have the reference here. I thought I did. Who's got a cross reference? It doesn't sound right. It is right. Colossians 4, 14. Luke, the beloved physician, and he must have been friends with Demas. All right. I don't have a Bible pen. Okay, I need to put that in here. And then, uh, so Paul's traveling with a doctor. Why is he traveling with a doctor? Obviously, those apostolic signs <coughs> are not as prevalent and as they were back in the end of the book of Acts. One more verse, 2 Timothy 4, and verse 20. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left, Paul was there with him, have I left at Miletum sick. So what happened to Paul's apostolic signs? They ran out. They're done for a time. Turn back to Mark. We'll close with Mark 16. Somebody tells you they got the apostolic signs. It's real simple. It's real simple. You just test them. Just test them with, uh, I don't know, pick anything. I got a can of acetone in there. That would probably do the trick. I don't know how deadly that is, but it would be terrible for sure. Um, I know Drano has like the skull and bones on it. That's probably deadly. 
and that uh, denatured alcohol, you're not supposed to drink that like regular alcohol. That's really bad news from what I understand. So uh, you just pick your random poison, whatever you got on hand, and ask somebody to drink it because it said in Mark 16, if they drink any, what does it say? Any deadly thing, verse 18, it shall not hurt them. Now, I haven't witnessed that myself. I haven't seen anybody handle any snakes and get bit with them, but I have seen that some of those snake handler people will take the snakes and they will drain the venom out of them and they'll water it down and they'll build up an immunity to it so that when a snake that's already had its fangs drained somewhat strikes them, they're already immune to that minor amount of poison that they have left. And that's called putting on a good show, a deceptive, a deceptively good show. Well, why do you got to deceive people if the verse said that you can get bit by a snake, a poisonous snake, and it won't hurt you? Why do you got to deceive people if it's true? If it's not true, just admit that it's not true. So remember what I said at the beginning. If you don't understand all the doctrine in the Bible, but your heart is right, you won't get tripped up with false doctrine for very long. How much, how much um, of a right heart do you need for you to go up to a healing line and somebody to walk up to you in the healing line and say, hey, here's $50, put that in your pocket. Can you act like you have a limp until you get up to the front of the line? This was um, Greg Wall in Pensacola. Standing in the healing line, oh, and maybe it was $20 back then. Would, you'd better give me 50 at least today. But <clears throat> gave him $20 in the healing line and asked him to fake an ailment so that when he got up to the line, then he could... <laughs> He could fix the goiter or the limp or whatever they asked him to do. Now, how come you got to cheat and lie and trick people if what you have is the truth? Okay, so that's what I mean by your heart will keep you right if uh, will keep you on the right path if you keep your uh, interest in the truth. Now, last thing, look at the verse. Last time, Mark sixteen seventeen, <clears throat> and these signs shall be given to everyone that believes. Know what it says? Didn't say that. Now, you might have thought it said that when you read it that way, but it didn't say that. These signs shall follow them that believe. Now, what's the difference? I mean, one person, one re way of reading it is that if you get saved and get, well, believe and be baptized in verse 16 then you're given the signs for sure. Now, what if it just means what it says and it doesn't mean more like you want it to mean? These signs shall follow them. Well, how about a guy gets saved by an apostle? Did that happen? A hundred times in the book of Acts. Thousands of times. A guy gets saved by an apostle and then the signs follow the salvation. How do they follow? They continue to see signs being performed. 2 Corinthians 12.12 12. These signs of the apostle were performed among you. You see that? These signs shall follow doesn't mean every single person that believes that got saved by a disciple gets the signs given to them the way the apostle had it given to him. Could some of them? Yeah, Julius and Adrianicus and Apollos and the rest of them. Barnabas, sure. There was more that the Lord allowed to have those signs. But that doesn't say that every person shall get a sign that believes. If they have the signs... Those signs that follow, verse 17, in my name shall they cast out devils. That's a sure thing. Notice the shall in verse 17. The shall speak with new tongues, shall take up serpents, shall uh, lay hands, shall not hurt them, shall recover. These aren't, maybe they work sometimes, maybe they don't. If you have the signs of the apostle, it works. If you're the apostle Paul at the end of his life and you no longer have the signs of the apostle, they don't work. It was 100% no misfires until the Lord started taking those signs away and saying, okay, my time of convincing the Jewish people that the Gentiles are A-OK -okay to come into this church thing, this new thing that I'm doing, you got all you're going to get. And if you don't believe it now, we're done. You don't get any more. And we'll, we'll have to run through the book of Acts next time. I want to cover some things on baptism in verse 16, because that's another tricky verse, and it was part of this question here, but it's a too much to get into now and then show in the book of acts that different people are receiving the holy ghost different ways 
How many of you have heard me as a pastor get accused of teaching multiple plans of salvation? Anybody hear that one yet? Oh, you guys don't get out much. Okay. Well, you will. Good. Hmm. Oh, oh yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. There's people in this town that can't stand me. Yep. And tell people not to come to our church. Our church would be twice as big if wolves of the body of Christ did not be wolves. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Take that clip and put it on YouTube. I'll send it to, I'll give you the email addresses. <laughs> it's at the beginning that I've learned to have grace with other people that believe differently than me. My Baptist independent brethren haven't learned that. And the way that I'm able to have grace with other people is that I understand how you could go to a Roman Catholic church and get a real scrawny amount of Bible, just a real flaky, watered down, nothing amount of Bible. And, and then you ask a question one day and a Catholic priest shows you in the Old Testament the place where it talks about sprinkling. So that's going to be my first reference next week in Ezekiel. I shall sprinkle upon you and I will heal you and I will cleanse you of your filthiness. Well, that sounds pretty good. Let's get saved. Let's get sprinkled. Well, if he doesn't read the next two verses, you don't ever know that it talks about Israel being brought back into the land. And, and, and I will bring you into the land is in the context. You can't get leave that part out. But they do. Now, can you have grace with somebody that's been shown the verse on sprinkling in the Bible and thinks that their sprinkling cleansed them and healed them from their filthiness? It said it in the verse. That's why I read you all those out-of-context verses in the beginning. He leads me beside the still. Now, it's a little extreme, but that's what people are doing in, all the, in religions every day. They're taking a verse that says, have you, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? We knew not whether there be any Holy Ghost. Okay, independent Baptist, brother, fellow, wolf, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Because somebody got asked that in the book of Acts. What's the answer, one of you guys? What's the answer? Yep, simpler than that. That's true, that's the answer. But I received the Holy Ghost when I believed. I was sealed unto the day of redemption, the day I got saved. But Apollos' disciples weren't. You can tell me they weren't saved? They were saved, and they hadn't received the Holy Ghost yet. That preacher over across town preaches multiple plans of salvation. Yes, I do. Not for you. Not for the, why are we ringing so bad? Am I yelling? Not for you, <clears throat> not today, but for everybody else in different church ages and different time periods and different courses and God's dealings with judgment. Religion is rigid. Religion says do, 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 and it shall be maybe okay. <laughs> and that's not what Jesus Christ says. Jesus Christ says, come unto me and I'll give you rest. This is the way, walk ye in it. The Lord leads you differently and guides you differently. I'm not talking about the doctrine of salvation in the church age. I'm talking about a relationship with the Lord is allowed to be different with different people in different time periods. All right? And the Lord's allowed to do that. And not only is he allowed to, he's done it many times. So if you can't understand that, stay safe and stay in your independent, fundamental, Baptist, do nothing, complain about everybody else and get mad at everybody else that is seeing people get saved and does have the Lord working through their ministries, even though they're not doing it just like you do it. And you can live there in that um, bitterness or uh, mad at the Lord because there's not 100 people to preach to or whatever you're going on in your heart. And the Lord will continue leading and guiding people that are having a right heart and are pleasing, trying to be pleasing to him. That's all he asks. That's all the Lord asks. Okay. Lord, I ask that you'd bless the lesson today. I ask you'd help uh, people that ask the question be able to hear it and understand it. And Lord, I ask that you please bless the direction of this church. Lord, I ask you'd help us to practice what I just said, and practice what we preach, and be listening to your leading and guiding and what you have us do and not do. Lord, I ask that you please help us to be bold for you to believe you and to trust you and to be able to speak for you. And Lord, I ask you to help us this week going out in the holiday season that we'd be able to put a smile on our face and be able to bring up uh, your son and give him some give him some truth that they're not going to hear maybe on a card or in a on a display, Lord, but give them the truth of the whole story of your uh, birth and your death and burial and resurrection. 
Lord, I ask you to bless that we go this separate ways this week. In Jesus' name, amen.